Mera, Managing Director, uh, General Manager of uh, Sri Lanka Conventions Bureau, Mr. G.B. Sritar, Regional Director, South Asia, Middle East and Africa International Group, Singapore Tourism Board, just next to me, Mr. Upali Ratnayaka, Director General of the Sri Lanka Tourism Development Authority, Mr. John Bellman, Managing Director of Bellman Studio, Professor Dr. Brian King, Associate Dean, School of Hotel and Tourism Management of the Hong Kong Polytechnic University, Mr. Stephen Brady Miles, Center Director, William Manglis Institute, and uh, Professor Chandi Jawadana of uh, uh, he is president of uh, Chandi Associates. So that's the uh, panel that we have. And uh, in order to open the discussion of lessons learned from global practices, what we are trying to see is that how Sri Lanka can go beyond the usual sun, sea, and the sand, which we are very used to. Now the panel of the panelists will take care of this area in different ways and based on their experiences. And we see that tourism as a catalyst for peace, going beyond the normal sun, sea, and the sand. It's not, it's not only an economic contribution that we are getting, but it is basically a means of cultural exchanges to harmonious understanding and cooperation between different people. So Sri Lanka is now facing and experiencing a period of peace and tourism will only enhance the value that we can give to human understanding and the peace that we have achieved after such great struggle. It brings people together and it does remove. The more we understand, the more we get close to each other, it helps to remove prejudice and work towards social justice. So therefore, the catalytic nature of tourism will lead to things like equality, social justice, development of rural villages, which is very important for a country like Sri Lanka. It's not only the urban, but the rural must develop because 70 to 80 percent of our people live in the rural. Poverty elevation, therefore, volunteerism to give selflessly, development of sports, they're doing a lot of uh, sports adventure and uh, including family travel. So some of the changes in tourism industry will be human, uh, will be geopolitical because of the exchange of people and the understanding of different cultures, different religions, economic, technological, and environmental. So what does it mean for the marketer in terms of tourism development. If such changes take place, if such amount of uh, understanding is uh, established, then when you're looking at your markets, you need to identify the relevant markets. Strategies can be multiple and given integrated value adding, we need to have targets sharpened up and they have to be response driven. No longer can we go through the normal and traditional media where you do something and wait for the results. This has to be supported by obviously tourism leading to cyber tourism and therefore this will this will create 
cyber tourism and tourism hubs. So with those thoughts, I will invite our panelists to give their ideas in their own ways and in their own, based on their own experiences. So may I invite Inoshi to take the stage. Thank you. Good afternoon to you all. Uh, by way of introduction, I'm representing Sri Lanka Convention Bureau. So the C Sri Lanka Convention Bureau belongs to the, it, it's, it's part of Sri Lanka tourism, and our main mandate is to promote mice tourism. So this, I feel, is where, since we're speaking of global trends and global learnings, where the tourism ministry actually has, has been ahead of the curve in recognizing and differentiating that mice tourism is a distinct pillar to be promoted. So Sri Lanka Promotion Bureau is the body that's supposed to promote leisure tourists, and SLCB, our main mandate, as I said, was to promote mice tourism. So when we look at the bodies, especially in the region, promoting mice tourists, the biggest learning and what we see a, a growing trend in the environment is where they have, where they promote quality tourists. Quality tourists means with the increasing discerning travelers and their needs, and most of them stemming from the importance they put on environmental impact of tourism, etc., where the bodies come in to promote sustainable tourism and take into account and bring in all the stakeholders together to promote environmentally friendly solutions in this environment. So looking at it on a very macro level, what we see is there are endeavors that they pursue um, where spaces and buildings are made in an environmental friendly way. And they support these three R strategies. What three R means is reuse, recycle and reduce waste and they bring in like the hoteliers come together on their own accord to reduce their solid waste by coming into the scheme. So these are some of the examples of some of the endeavors that these bodies that are in this environment promoting. We also see the MICE event organizers um, going into more recyclable badges, looking at sustainable products, um, moving on to mobile phone platforms. So they're moving away from print material. So on an overall and holistic level, they're embracing sustainability from the ground level. And this, I feel, is a pillar that, especially mice tourism, because we're talking big numbers. Just, just to introduce, mice means meetings, incentives, conventions, conferences, exhibitions, uh, and events. So we're talking large numbers. So whatever the footprint or whatever the impact these tourists make, they're in multiple folds. So whatever, whatever pillars that we try to support mice, we will have to support them on that many levels. When, <clears throat> when we think of events, events bring together communities and there is a lot of social togetherness coming through a common, um, common goal, a common event. But beyond looking at the first stakeholder, which is the customer and that satisfaction, we can bring in the communities, the staffing aspect. We can look at, and the way we can do that is by training, collaborating with them on workshops, um, going through local um, suppliers, looking at sustainable, ethical producers, um, and things like that. So in terms of SLCB and our mandate and how we can learn um, from the global practices, I feel the biggest pillar that we should further and where all the industry members also should recognize this as an important factor and a USP and a differentiating aspect that they should pursue is sustainable tourism and how to reduce the carbon footprint. In the littlest things you do, it doesn't have to be, uh, you know, going into the, the 
the bigger projects. You can start small, but that is how you roll up into a bigger USP. And you will see there are lots of corporations and associations who are the biggest feeders for mice tourism, where they themselves have embraced these as things that their corporations or their associations want to pursue. So when you're organizing an event or when you're organizing a MICE activity that also supports these endeavors, you will see the multiplier effect coming from that. So that is what I want to leave with you in, in terms of SLCB and in terms of what we want to further and what we want to see as bringing in you know, global learnings and global, the mandates that the global bodies have embraced when it comes to MICE tourism. Thank you. Thank you, Inoshi. I think you made some valid points about quality tourism and uh, emphasized the importance of sustainability. OK. With that, we will uh, get on to the other panelists. And uh, all the panelists will take five minutes for their presentations, and at the end of it, we will leave a little more room for further discussion. Mr. G.B. Svitar, Regional Director, Southeast Asia. Yes, sir. Check. Okay. Are you Bowen? So five minutes. Thank, thank you, Chairman. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to just uh, set the context. The topic I'm going to just focus on is inclusiveness. And let me talk about, from the Singapore Tourism Board's perspective, how we have taken the brand, right? So uh, every destination has got a brand. And we have taken the approach of how we can evolve our brand. So any country, when they are promoting their country, over a period of time, the brands change. So Singapore Tourism Board, 1964, we were set up. Early 70s, our brand was Surprising Singapore. Then it became New Asia Singapore. Uh, and in about 1990s, we adopted the brand Uniquely Singapore. And thereafter, it was Your Singapore. Your Singapore was that it is going to be so customizable, so easy for you to enjoy, that you can make it Your Singapore. And then in year 2015, we decided that we need to review the brand. It was our 50th birthday. 2015 was our 50th birthday. It was the passing away of our founder uh, of modern Singapore, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. And there was a lot of reflection going on in the country, and therefore we took the opportunity to sort of review our brand. And what we decided, we will have a very inclusive brand. So we had uh, a consultations across the various Singapore tourism stakeholders. We then, so that was the first step. The second step, we then brought it out to the market. Our top 10 source markets, we talked to our travelers, talked to the consumers, and asked them how did they view Singapore. We then brought it back to the Singapore stakeholders as well as within the Singapore government. And then we came out with a new brand, which was an inclusive brand, a unified brand, and an inside-out brand. For the very first time, we have adopted a brand where the voices of Singaporeans talks about Singapore. So it is post-launch. I thought maybe a video is good. So without me talking too much, I'm going to now play for you our latest brand film. Please play the video, please. There is no place like this. There is no place like this. This is the place. This is the place I call home. Our home. This is where 1212 and 112 are not just dancing steps. Back streets live on as galleries and museums. This is where we live amongst trees. Carve them out of metal and make them electric. Where impossibilities lead us to endless possibilities. This is where old school, new school, and what no school can teach come together. This is where who you were will not be 
This is where all that you're passionate about, all that drives you, is made possible. This is where passion is made possible. This is your stage! So we unveiled this new brand, Passion Made Possible, in August 2017, last year. And in two, two main points, so uh, it is the voices of Singaporeans, and they are our passion ambassadors. So what you will see, for example, the lady, the girl at the very end, she is the world champion for indoor skydiving, Kaira Po, very young lady. And so these are the passion ambassadors. We've got about 100, 100 of them. And through their voices, Singaporeans' stories, Singapore stories are being told. And we then welcome the travelers to come and enjoy the Singapore they have enjoyed and make their passions possible in Singapore. The second point is about passion tribes. I think all of us in the travel fraternity, we will know that the travel of the future, even currently, is starting to happen. We travel for our passions. So we have got seven uh, tribes, passion tribes we call them. So whether you're a foodie, whether you're a collector, whether you're an explorer, all those passions are made possible in Singapore and you can live up and experience Singapore the way you want to experience Singapore. So that is our uh, brand, new brand, Passion Made Possible, taking on a very inclusive angle, voices of Singaporeans for the brand. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sritar. I think there are some wonderful lessons that we as Sri Lankans also can learn from what, the, what Singapore has done. See, they are getting into inclusiveness. Everybody has to be included. And the other is the value of the brand. The next is that these brands don't last forever. They have to keep on changing with the changing aspirations of the people. Uh, uniquely Singapore to your Singapore and now passion made possible. Passion made possible. See the wonderful way that they have created this evolution into what Singapore is today. The next important point that he did said was that they involved all stakeholders. We cannot build brands either for the product or for a country working in silos. We have to involve all the stakeholders. And then he talked about passion tribes. Uh, in a way, some segmentation. So these are some of the key lessons from his uh, talk. And let us now listen to Mr. Upali Ratnayaka, Director General of the Sri Lanka Tourism Development Authority. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chair. Yeah. Uh, I represent <coughs> Sri Lanka Tourism Development Authority. Uh, Sri Lanka Tourism <coughs> Sri Lanka Tourism Development Authority is the uh, four uh, arms under Tourism Ministry. Our responsibility mainly the regulation, planning, and also uh, community relations. Uh, also go ahead with uh, various other uh, issues attending when, they, when, when and then. Uh, industry needed especially the planning as well as the regulation we have a very bigger role where as per the policy of the tourism and the guidance of the ministry uh, we have the total responsibility drive the industry whereas our sister organization as uh, Shani mentioned the convention part one organization and promotional part where our chair is the chairman and also the human resource by the SLITHM. Other than that, all other responsibilities lies with us, in which we also look at what best practices we also can share with others as well as what best practices we also adopt from the world for the betterment of the industry and the, its tomorrow. When look at planning, uh, the mainly the guidance to the industry uh, giving a target to the industry, for example, as per the target of the 
promotion bureau about the future market how many rooms how many other services need to be available in the country and also like our competing guest what are the quality they look for what are the experience they look for and also what do we have in the country what else need to be added to fulfill that requirement how best we can work with the private sector all the tourism services are offered by the private sector where the guidance as well as the assistance is necessary but on the other hand meeting the minimum quality standard and also the ensuring the satisfaction of the guests for the continuity of the market it our responsibility to do that we always look at when it is a five star or maybe when it is a small luxury hotel what are the quality offered by the world and also what our client or a tourist look for so in which how we be we try to be abreast with the world standard so for which so we got to have the rules and regulation in place and then educate the private sector and also the get get compliances when they offer the services more importantly when there is a new project coming up how do we keep them informed how do we uh, 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 make them aware in the future what kind of a standard that they need to maintain all those things in the planning perspective so we we communicate with the investors as well very importantly when there is investment project there are 10 to 12 organization need to grant approval for example environment clearance by the either uh, central and non authority or maybe the coast conservation department if it is in the coastal area for those things also the best practice we exercise for the tourism industry is we take all the agencies together and try to take a decision which is the practice in most of the developed countries uh, for the interest of the investor of course i don't say that we have a perfect model but again we try to improve it continuously uh, and also like within very short period of time we try to assist them so likewise in fulfilling the requirement of the industry uh, investor assistance as well as the product assistance is in our hand go beyond since my time is limited let me uh, quickly <coughs> illustrate the yeah, other areas and also we work with uh, in sri lanka as per the uh, as per the uh, the constitution the tourism is a devolved subject we have nine provinces the nine provinces also make an effort to develop the tourism in their respective areas and there are so many lesser known attraction there are there are infrastructure requirement for all those requirements we work closely with the provincial councils and their tourism ministries and also the uh, the, the autonomy body uh, maybe tourist board tourism bureaus uh, formed by those ministries also working with us we made them at least quarterly then we give them a technical support we give them financial support and ensure that the future those provinces will be supported or may be ready with necessary infrastructure and also more attraction so our aim is to bring the tourism benefit to the areas where it is not developed and also like bringing the tourists or giving the tourists more opportunity as well as the more attraction so likewise what other countries for example this is the practice in england so likewise uh, we work with province some countries it is state government but in our country it's a province so we closely try to work and we try to listen to them and also we work with them and also the cooperate with them for the technical requirement as well as the funding requirement likewise we uh, like work with all the provinces which is again a, uh, what world practice as a best practice and also like it is it is an uh, uh, quite important support hmm? we are the provinces we are need a help for example eastern province or maybe northern province any other province who were uh, recently joined with tourism so we give them a support then again uh, tourism is a dynamic industry in which day to day knowledge as well as the uh, about the market and also the product development is trend all those things are important so therefore we also work with university for example this event the leaders summit and also the research conference is uh, closely the the university of colombo and other universities linked with this are connected to the sltda so that we 
closely work with the university. Finally, the outcome of this kind of a valuable forum also is an input tomorrow to us. So likewise, we demand the knowledge for that one also how other countries, for example, a country like Thailand or a country like Hong Kong. So they work closely with the universities and those university knowledge also we try to incorporate for the betterment of the industry as well as the future. And whatever the knowledge we gather, we'll, we'll keep it available or rather communicate with the industry, uh, with association, wherever is possible. Then again, in our industry, we, we strongly believe the training requirement for any development. So therefore, not only the main four areas like front office or maybe the housekeeping, those goes uh, common area. Beyond those areas, whether it's a driver, whether it's a guide, whether it's an interpreter or maybe a homestay operator, everyone, wherever the training requirement is, we undertake, including like uh, uh, police officers who work in a tourist police and also the lifeguard unit uh, officers work, in, work with the uh, life-saving department or life-saving units of the Coast Guard department. So likewise, uh, the training requirement where I were not entertain entertaining by the uh, 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 existing system, we also try to fix it, which is again uh, in developed countries when you look at any tourism service, they let them offer the service after the training. But in our country, there are some services without a training, they try to do it where it affects to the quality and effect to the uh, service value of the uh, guests. So to prevent this situation, we, uh, we try to learn from other countries as well as we try to uh, establish our own. And the final one, like uh, in future, we are planning to have uh, 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 complying with the sustainability goal, uh, sustainable goal of the UN, so we try to establish a uh, sustainable certification scheme for the tourism services in the country. Initially, it will be a volunteer thing, but in future, we are, we are trying to make it uh, somewhat feel important as well as uh, make it uh, essential uh, in the future so that m almost all the services, at least in two years' time, we are planning to bring it to the sustainability platform so that we'll be able to uh, win the market in the future as well as be abreast with the, what the world is practicing as best practices in the country. Thank you, Mr. Ratnayake. So, dear friends, you saw from our side we are talking of promotions. Then we are learning lessons from other countries. Uh, you know, she talked about the meetings, conventions and other things, related matters. Now, Mr. Ratnayaka was talking really about the development of the product. Uh, having the rules and the regulations, uh, having a public-private partnerships. He talked about quality, development of quality. He really talked about the macro and the micro levels where the organization is going to finally improve the product called Sri Lanka. So that was his role, and uh, that's what he's doing at the Tourism Development Authority, and thank you, Mr. Ratnayaka. The next presenter will be Mr. John Belmond, Managing Director of Belmond Studio. And Mr. Belmond is a very creative person, being the son of a very creative architect. And yes. uh, may I hand you, hand you over to Mr. Belmont. Thank you very much. Thank you. And it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invite. Um, I'm actually half Sri Lankan and half American, uh, but born and raised in the UK. And surprised my family 10 years ago when I said I want to return to Sri Lanka. Uh, and I've been here now uh, 10 years, full-time, and it's been a wonderful uh, and very interesting journey. What, um, my, my father, just briefly, was born here, educated here, and has had an incredible career in architecture, working on some of the most famous and iconic buildings in the world, uh, as a young man on the Sydney Opera House, to the CCTV Towers in Beijing, to the London Olympic Towers, um, and gave the Jeffrey Bauer Memorial Lecture many years ago. 
And John Keels were in the audience and said, we didn't realize there was a Sri Lankan born who's done all this. So what brought me here is my father said, John, don't forget your Sri Lankan roots, thinking I would be, you know, in the West. And we had this lovely piece of land uh, for inheritance in Kalpitiya. And I remember going there as a, as a young boy and seeing this lovely deserted beach and thinking we should do something more with this than just leave it to build a family home one day. And what really struck me was how the villagers were living there, using natural wood, using kajan, using iluk, all these materials I really never knew about, but was totally fascinated by them. And it took two years to convince my parents to, you know, uh, give me their blessing to invest and do this project, although I knew nothing about hospitality. I knew nothing about how things worked and businesses in Sri Lanka uh, or design. I'd never built anything as well. But sometimes fortune favors the brave. And uh, I was very fortunate that I had their encouragement and came here and did my first project, Palagama Beach, that opened uh, about yeah, eight, nine years ago. And we were very lucky because there were dolphins that just happened to be in the ocean. And I think that's what really helped people to come to that area all those years ago. So when I was there, I met up with a fellow uh, uh, person who was in Sri Lanka, a chap called Tim Edwards, whose father had set up Tiger Tops in Nepal as one of the very first conservation tourism uh, developments in the world in the 1970s. I think the concept actually originated somewhere there. So as chance and luck would have it, I met his son, and we both have a natural passion for conservation. So we decided to do a tour of all the national parks of Sri Lanka. And we went to the more forgotten national parks, like Kumana, Waskamua, Madru Oya. And in fact, we settled on and fell in love with Galoya. Now Galoya is near Ampara, and it's one of Sri Lanka's largest lakes, so big that it has these islands, and you see the swimming elephants swimming between these islands with these low-lying mountains, and you see it at sunset or sunrise. It was just a magical experience, and knew we had to do something there. So when I went to the banks and said to people, look, I'm, I'm going to do a project in Galoya. I need some funding. They're like, why? Who's going to come? It's in the middle of nowhere. You know, it's like there was a perception that it was just like a thousand kilometers away from Colombo. And I think one of Sri Lanka's greatest blessings is its size. The fact it's more or less 400 kilometers long and 200 kilometers wide. In fact, you can get to these places. Um, but eventually persuaded people to help us. And we... Um, opened almost three or four years ago and it's been a remarkable success because we bought 30 acres of land we then went to the villagers and said you come and build this for us only using natural materials from the jungle so this entire resort only 12 cabanas was built all by hand all by Sri Lankans nothing imported nothing added to that we were in the, an area that we didn't understand at the time, which was the Vedas. It was their area. It is their area. So there was one thing, me turning up with the deed saying, I'd like to develop this land. And they were saying, who are you? You're our guest. And I had to really respect that. And I was in these meetings with the Vedas, uh, with their long beards and their sarongs, and obviously had to be very respectful. And I'm very happy to say it took time for us to gain the understanding of one another. And I'm very happy that we have empowered their local community by they come to our resort and they take our guests for walks into the jungle. And this is precisely what a certain group of tourists are really looking for. They're really looking for this experiential feeling of being in Sri Lanka 
you know, being in these remote, beautiful, untouched parts, being in these developments built by villagers, walking with the Vedas through the virgin jungles, and then going on these boat safaris and seeing the swimming elephants. And I've been, I've been very lucky that this has been a real success and has really given me the confidence to now look at the more remoter parks and areas like Kumana, Madruoya, Waskamua. And I believe I'll be able to create, with the support of the tourism board, which have been very, very helpful and very supportive, one of Sri Lanka's real first conservation tourism brands. And it's, it's the most perfect platform in the world, as far as I can see. You know, I have a good understanding of the Western mind, and being here and being raised by a very Asian father, a good understanding of the Sri Lankan mind. And you really have to understand both. You can't take one ideal and put here. You have to understand both. And I feel very um, grateful uh, still to be here after 10 years, and I'm very much uh, looking forward to the future. I'm very impressed with how the island's developing and moving forward. And um, thank you very much for listening to my story. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Bellman. We're glad to have you in Sri Lanka for a long time, and we'll, I hope that we'll be here for many more years. In fact, what he was trying to say is that uh, another aspect of uh, developing our product, the infrastructure. He was talking about the infrastructure, a person with a passion for developing beautiful and attractive infrastructure. He also mentioned one phrase which struck me. He says, he said, untouched parts of Sri Lanka. So now this is a lesson to us that there are several areas which are now getting over-visited. There are several areas unexplored. So it is up to us to go after them and open Sri Lanka to the rest of the world. His observations also brought me to the thought of our strategic plan, which has three components, diversity, authenticity, and compactness. In his addressed to us, he also talked about the authenticity in different ways, going to the rural and seeing the people, the rustic rural person of Sri Lanka, the Vedas, and the terrific diversity that we have, and in this little country which is just 25,000 square miles, all and that seems to be our precious uniqueness to market Sri Lanka. So thank you, Mr. Belmont, for this very thought-provoking words. And we now get on to a king, Professor Dr. Brian King, who is the Associate Dean, School of uh, Tourism Management uh, in the Hong Kong Polytechnic University. Over to you, sir. OK, thanks. Um, thanks, Chair. Great to be here. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about innovation, and I'm going to share an example from Hong Kong, which I hope will be instructive for, uh, for those of you from uh, Sri Lanka. I'm a Scot, but lived in Australia for many years. And in 2012, I made the move to Hong Kong. Now, why did I shift from a beautiful environment in Melbourne, Australia, to, to Hong Kong? It was because I saw a very interesting development, and I wanted to be part of it. Hong Kong Polytechnic University invested a very large amount of money, 170 million US dollars, in a teaching and research hotel. They wanted to pick examples from Swiss hotel schools, from American, from other places, and to put it in an Asian context. It was a very big investment. And the purpose is to be research, just like Department of Economics at University of Colombo, but also to be about teaching, developing young people, and about innovation. And in a minute, I'll show you a quick uh, uh, visual uh, in Hong Kong. Now, in hospitality, we can sometimes love our traditions. You know, we like putting the little chocolate on the pillow so when the guest arrives, they think, how delightful. 
But how many times have you had a chocolate in the pillow and thought, I'm not really wanting chocolate this time. This has been going on for a long time. There are many habits that we have in hotels which are traditional and which we can cherish. But this is a very changing environment. We've got Airbnb, we've got digital disruption. The hotel industry is being turned on its head. So we need our future generation of young hoteliers, of leaders, to be open to different ways of doing things. Now what I'd like to do now is if we can just show this video for 90 seconds and then I'll turn it to mute so that it's just on in the background. And this is one of our uh, students who will share with you, I hope. She's going to share with you. Some people say upscale hotels are more or less the same. Hotel icon owned by the Hong Kong Polytechnic University is definitely unlike any other. As an ambassador of Hong Kong, Hotel Icon offers a fresh interpretation of Asian hospitality. That's Hong Kong's first electric um, uh, shuttle bus. The Green Wall, located in our lobby, is certainly my favorite in this hotel. Compromising of more than 71 species and 8,000 plants, it is the largest indoor vertical garden in Asia. want to be available for any means of contact. Therefore, we provide handy smartphone in every guest room. You can enjoy free local and international calls to 25 countries, and also free key mobile internet access across Hong Kong. Comprehensive Hong Kong City Guide is also pre-installed for your convenience. So what I want to share with you is how, by investing in a high-quality facility like this, which has about 50 students operating at any time, but is professionally run, we can incubate lots of new ideas for the hotel industry more widely in, in Hong Kong, and many of these ideas are picked up. We can do that in a way that they say the chain hotels cannot do. So, for example, in our hotels, maybe here in Colombo, you often have people knocking on the door saying, have you had anything from your midi bar? Uh, can you tell us what's been happening? Um, in this particular example, we introduced free mini bar with also alcoholic beverages. And that, we thought the cost was not that high. We also, as the student explained, we introduced a mobile phone for all our guests so they can really get around Hong Kong most, more easily. We have a lounge where when guests arrive early in the day, they don't have to be sent out into the streets, they can enjoy that environment. We brought in the first electric vehicles into Hong Kong and the vehicle fleet is all electric and you saw the green wall. I can talk about many of these innovations but in time, interests of time I won't. The other thing that we do is we have regular seminars for the industry, talking about the future of concierge, about um, OTAs, about revenue management, many of the issues that are very set about electric vehicles, things which are central to the future of our industry. And things like the free mini bar and the, uh, the, the mobile phone have now been picked up by many of the hotel chains in Hong Kong and in Macau uh, because they believe that is something that's been properly tested. We have some guest rooms of the future where we prototype other things. We were lucky enough to host a large group from Sri Lanka Institute of Hospitality and Tourism Management. They came over for a couple of weeks and learned um, some, had some shared knowledge. And I know that Sri Lanka is doing great things, but like everywhere in the world, the hospitality industry is quite conservative. And I believe that we can all learn from innovation, from challenging the ways that we do things, from having dialogue with our industry partners. Stuff, if you are developing a product. He talked about research. First, we need to know our facts and data. 
This is where the problem is in many cases. We just run after our passions, but uh, we really don't have the facts and data with us. So his whole speech was revolving around the importance of research and the results obtained if we follow those professional paths. He is also developing the future for Hong Kong. The future for Hong Kong. And what is that? That is the younger generation developing them, developing the manpower of Hong Kong. In the area of hospitality, he showed the example of Hotel Icon and showed how you can project Asian hospitality. In this era where people are going across to the west, going to the east, going to the Middle East and all over the place, here we are trying to see how we can retain the uniqueness of Asian hospitality. A few things, innovative things, like the free minibar and the mobile phone, are things that sometimes bogs our minds. But here is an example of a hotel. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. All right. Good stuff. Okay. Uh, welcome. Look, for me, it's an honour to be here at, once again. Uh, this is the fifth time that I've actually presented at this uh, summit. Uh, I am originally from Melbourne, Australia. I arrived into Sri Lanka in 2013. I worked here for five weeks and fell in love with the country, and I've been here for the last six years. For all of you here today, I'd have to thank the panel members already, who have actually taken a lot of my ideas that I was going to discuss today, about innovation, dynamic components, particularly related to curriculum. Uh, here at William Angus Institute at SLIT, we really focus on how we update our curriculum with industry engagement, which Professor King has already spoken about. One really important factor for us in training the youth is to allow the youth to be creative and do things wrong. And again, in this country here, upper school is all about studying theoretically and not really applying anything practically. So the challenge for us in the hospitality industry is when someone's come out of O level or A level, they're very theoretically in the know-how, but practically it's very hard to apply. So our students actually struggle in the first six months because they may not have the manual or the book and they go practically into, obviously, the components of the industry. As educators here, of course, we want to see tourism grow and we need our youth to embrace the country itself. We stimulate, we challenge and we nurture. We try and change the curriculum again, updating with technology, with advances, and important for us is finding out exactly what industry needs for their labour force and how we train the future of that labour force. One thing that's happening in Australia at the moment which could be seen as best practice or what I'd like to say is continuous improvement is where schools have actually started to see extremely high academic people in very private schools, this is general upper schools, who study, 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 receive 100% but go out to the workforce and they struggle. So the Australian curriculum in secondary school now actually has subjects where students are designed to fail. So they realise that you can't be perfect in everything that you do. Now we could argue whether that's best practice or whether that's continuous improvement, but sometimes it's also pulse check and a reality check for a student. When I look at the, uh, the students here that are going out to industry, I see that the students themselves are embracing change, they're thinking differently, and we have to do that again for continuous improvement. Some of the panel members here today have spoken about environmental sustainability. Since 2013, I've no noticed that more and more of the youth are concerned about the environment, which is really, again, continuous improvement. If there are educators out here in primary school or upper school, what I'd like to see in the country is more of a curriculum based on the environment so that it helps us all in the tourism industry. And that would be ideal. So from a curriculum point of view for us, we then look at the practices of environmental sustainability to, so that we can have our students, when they're going to the workforce, challenge some of the existing practices that need to change. I'm still amazed that I can drive to Malabi every day and still see people burning rubbish on the road. 
I'm still amazed to see that plastic is still being burnt in this country. I'm amazed that when I go into Mount Lavinia Beach at certain times of the year, I'm hit with plastic bags. If we want to obviously go further with our tourism industry here, we all have to embrace it. And the youth, I believe, are starting to think a lot differently to perhaps the people in the past. So today, to all the students that are out here, do your best, always think environmentally conscious, it's your future, and the people that come here want to, obviously, have a wonderful time. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Stephen Brady Mills. His words were directed at the students. One of the things that he said was, you may learn something, but it doesn't end there. Continuous improvement. We have to strive for continuous improvement. And he was emphasizing that. And how do we do that? By thinking differently. Different times will need different thinking. And the students are urged to think differently. Get out of the box. Think something new. Innovations. He also talked about the curriculum development. And this is also another contribution, a great contribution towards developing the manpower. So we have a whole heap of things to think about. We have a whole lot of things to start working on. We have a whole heap of things to start improving and continuously improve, as Mr. Miles said. I think we are running exactly on time and we are left with five more minutes. And uh, may I invite Professor Chandi Javadana to do the honors. Get up. You can use the, you can use the podium if you want. Yeah. Okay, I got permission to get up because I was falling asleep. Uh, can, I, can you get up, everybody? Please get up. Please get up. Yeah. Okay. We just heard that innovation is about doing things differently. Think outside the box. I want to give you two, uh, not something I have done. I've learned from my second or third home, Jamaica. Uh, two best practices. Uh, I think they are both very innovative, very thought-provoking and exciting. And in terms of destination marketing and aviation, they were... To me, I was excited. Uh, how many of you have been to Jamaica? Let me... Okay. Uh, the, those who have not been to Jamaica, please sit down. <laughs> One person standing. Very good. Uh, okay. So, Jamaica is a small island. It is one-fifth of size of Sri Lanka. They have 2.6 million people. They get same number of tourists a year. So they get one tourist per citizen. In Sri Lanka, we get... In Sri Lanka, we get uh, one tourist for 10 citizens, roughly, right? So Jamaica is a developing poor country, but they have this attitude, we can do things. You know, they have created the produce the fastest people on earth and the greatest boxers in the world, greatest musicians, small, tiny country. They believe they can do things because they think outside the box. My first impression about Jamaica was I worked for a British company called Trust House Forte. At that time, it was the largest hotel company in the world. There are nearly 1,000 hotels. I was an internationally mobile general manager. So that means my boss will call me and tell Call me until you are transferred to a new country, pack your bags, go. So I got a call like that. I was in England at that time. I packed my bags. I took a flight to Jamaica. I saw Jamaica in Heathrow when I get to, got into the plane. They were playing Bob Marley's music, One Love, etc. I smelled the Jamaican food, the fantastic food items. The girls, the stewardesses, stewards, they were all dressed in colorful dresses, you know, they're showing the African heritage. Plane started. 
I was in the, uh, I was not in business class, but uh, there was a traveling chef in the plane at Jamaica. He came and spoke with me. He said, I, I was the executive chef of one of the five-star hotels. Now I work for the airline. He came and when he got to know that I'm a hotelier, he asked, what do you like to eat? Took the order. I mean, so they create this sort of culture. And then, of course, I fell asleep. It was a night flight. Uh, and I woke up to a big noise in the morning, in the flight, morning time. All the stewardesses dressed up in leotards. We had to get up and do exercises, like the way you just got up. I thought it was fun. So they create the Jamaican experience from Heathrow in England and throughout the flight. The music, the food, what you see, what you smell, what you do. And we all have to learn some Jamaican words. You say, Yaman, and you raise the hands and do exercises and, you know, and then, before landing in Kingston, Kingston is like Colombo, the capital city of Jamaica, they did a fashion show. The, the air hostesses did a fashion show showing their garments, etc. I was a very happy person entering Jamaica. Then, of course, after many years later, I spent eight years in Jamaica. One day, I managed this big hotel. It's, it's the main business hotel in Kingston. I get a call from someone like my friend here. She is the director of tourism. The one, one director, director of tourism board is the chief executive of tourism. She called me and said, Chandi, uh, I need your help. Uh, I said, yeah, sure. What, what do you want? He said, you know, as you know, Jamaica qualified for the World Cup, World Cup soccer, or quick, uh, World Cup football. Now, this is the biggest sporting event in the world, bigger than Olympics. For a small, tiny country to qualify for World Cup, one of the 32 uh, final nations in that contest was a big, big thing. And they want to celebrate it. They want to celebrate it, linking it to tourism. That's a, that's a fun part. They link anything to tourism. So the lady called me and said, you know, and I, I saw the World Cup uh, qualifying match. They, they beat Costa Rica and qualified. So we were all happy. She said, you know, Jamaica qualified yesterday. I said, yeah, I was at the match. She said, we have decided to create the largest ball in the world, right? Nothing to do with tourism, nothing to do with uh, soccer, football, but that's what they decided to do. She said, uh, we checked the Guinness Book of World Records, we checked what's the biggest ball, we are going to produce the biggest ball ever produced in the world. We want to go to the Guinness Book of World Records. So it's like a shape of a soccer ball. So I said, what do you want from me? Uh, I'm not a ball constructor. <laughs> They said, no, we want to put it in the most prestigious address in Kingston, in your front uh, garden. The, the hotel was sort of a very nice location. I said, sure. And I can imagine now the publicity I, uh, my hotel will get. I said, sure, no problem. I will block a section of the garden. And the ball is size of uh, the height of three floors. It's a huge ball. So they did the ball a couple of uh, a week later. Constructed the ball. It was a work of art, work of engineering, work of architecture. Then they got everybody, who's who of Jamaica, to come to my hotel. It was Le Meridian, the French chain then. Come there, they kept uh, ladders, started with the governor general, then the prime minister, whole, all the ministers. Jamaica has also produced three Miss Worlds. They got the Miss Worlds to come, the actors, singers. Bob Marley's wife, they all had to go up and sign the ball. Eventually, I was also asked to go up. I was treated like a Jamaican. Sign the ball. So there were thousands of signatures on the ball. It was displayed outside the hotel for one week. World Cup was, uh, you know, taking place. I thought it's a great success story. But I want to tell you the other side of uh, innovation. I was reading a newspaper, the, uh, you know, after it was in, uh, sent to uh, France, there was a long list of criticism, petitions signed by the locals against the ball. <laughs> I, as a marketing guy, I thought it was a fantastic idea, and I used to talk about it to my master's students, and I was, but the general public did not think about it like that. So I said, what's the problem? And I, I called my friend, director of tourism, I said, what happened? How come people don't like it? So I read in the, I read in the newspaper articles, they say for the cost they spend building this ball, they could have built two hospitals or three schools in poorer communities. 
So I told the director to him, it's a great job. I liked it. But Faye, I think what happened was you did not do a good job with your internal selling. You did not, external marketing was great, but internal customer, you did not communicate. She said, no, Chandi, I, I talk. I talk with everybody in uh, tourist board, marketing, everybody thought it's a great idea. I said, no, you are wrong. Your internal customer is not the tourist board officials, but the community of the country. You know, so I just want to share that. I hope that was interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Professor Chandi Jawadra. He's a practical man. He was talking about uh, all practical stuff, the customer relationships, both internal and external customers. So it's very important for us to understand that there are internal customers and external customers. So thank you very much. To all the panelists who have shared their thoughts, on behalf of the organizers of this great summit, may I say thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for your preparation. And thanks a lot for sharing your views. This will help all of us. And uh, we have something to take back from this session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And we kindly request you to please remain on stage. Thank you. And I would like to invite Dr. D.A.C. Suranga Silva founder and coordinator of Marseille Tourism Economics and Hotel Management, Mr. Mubarak, Mr. Sampath, and Mr. Sumit, or lecturers at the University of Colombo, to please come forward to present tokens of appreciation to our speakers and our panel chair.